other styles of martial arts and they would have patterns and katas and things that you could practice on your own and you know you felt like you were doing martial arts you felt like a martial art doing it if someone was to watch you practicing in a park they could easily recognize hey that, that person is doing martial arts well when I got involved in Nimpo there wasn't as much availability to train on your own there wasn't katas there wasn't patterns there wasn't forms there wasn't necessarily like drills that you could do on your own uh, to practice and get better. Uh, then eventually I came across a couple things that were done as warm-ups, uh, was done in Japan, and they became things that I did on a daily or a regular basis. So the go gyo kata as many people know, this is simply a Bujinkan thing. The people in the Genbukan do not do it. The people in the Jininkan may do it, but it's not so much of a staple. This is very much a Bujinkan Hatsumi Sensei thing. Uh, the way I understand it is the Gogyo no Kata was taught to Hatsumi Sensei, completely invented or created by Takamatsu Sensei. Since Hatsumi Sensei was training with Takamatsu Sensei on the weekends only, Takamatsu Sensei needed Hatsumi Sensei to improve. So he gave him this Gogyo no Kata, created it for him to be able to practice. So when he returned every single weekend, his skills would continually improve and improve and improve. So if it was good enough for one grandmaster to another grandmaster, it should be good enough for us and for me to you. So most of you out there watching this video have, know the Go Gyo Kata, or at least can get the videos. I've got videos of it and I've got everything done. But I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the aspects and how you train with it. The Kamai, Bobi no Kamai, some people call Sanshi no Kamai, is here. When you practice the Go Gyo Kata, make sure your hips are down. The lower that you can get down to the ground, the more strength you're going to create in your legs. But you don't want to be too low to where it's heavy and hard to move. You need to be able to move your feet fluidly to be able to do this art. So keeping yourself down and being able to move your legs left and right, this type of movement is going to be important. And the Go-Gin Okada teaches you that. Another thing the Go-Gin Okada teaches you is completely transformation your weight. Your weight back on your blocks, your weight center for balance, using that balance to get strength, using that strength to be able to attack. You really can't go from a completely defensive posture and then quickly just transform into an offensive posture without being able to transition your body to get balance and control. Once you have that control, load it with strength and energy and deliver that into your opponent. So there is a transition there. The go gyo no kata, teaches you that transition. Remember the word gyo, go is five. Gyo is like a connection, like a link. It's taking those five elements, connecting together in a kata or a pattern. Go, gyo, no kata. The five elements connected in a pattern, done as a form. So that's what go, gyo, no kata means. A lot of people call it the song shin, and I'm gonna talk about that later, but I believe the song shin is not the right terminology. The San Shin simply means the three hearts. And that's a whole nother topic. So I believe that the Go Gyo no Kata is a proper way of saying it. And then you have Chi. Chi is earth. This is very solid. 
This is very, you want to take your toes and dig them down in the ground, almost like if you're on the sand and you're pulling dirt between your toes. So when you get into kamai for, for the for the chi, it's very much like <clears throat> down, toes in, strong. When you step and you strike, have some like strength and energy. Almost like your body's made of stone, like rocks and hard, strong. You know, it doesn't want to be very left. For chi, do it strong. Now again, this is a little bit different from how we would do the go gyo kata as a beginning exercise or a warm-up drill. I'm breaking this down for you today to be able to practice the individual aspects on its own and then link it together and then build strength with it. So when you do the chi no kata here, make sure that when you step back and you come forward, your front toes and back toes are digging in. And you're weighted down. <clears throat> and if someone was to try to move your arm, it's solid. Make your body strong. Your breathing is also important. From the come out here, you want to breathe in and breathe out. Now, you would never over exaggerate like I'm doing it. I'm doing it so you can hear it. It would just be done like this here. Now you can see a little differently. When you do the drill, it's very, it's kind of relaxed. So when you're doing it as a warm up. And this exercise, again, it's just an exercise. I want you to be strong. Down. One, two. One, two. One, two. And have strength in the strikes. Almost like there was something here, and you're just trying to break it. Taking these three fingers, shitan ken, coming up and breaking it. By doing that over and over and over, with the proper breathing, your legs are going to get stronger, your muscle tone is going to get stronger, because like swimming, your entire body is working out here. Your arms are moving, your legs are moving, your hips are moving, your core is moving. Everything's staying the same except your head. Your head stays very centered. Your body turns sideways. Sideways. But your eyes and your focus stays forward. No kata. Sweet no kata is the form of water. So you need to be very fluid. Think of it as a wave that's going back from the beach. It's the beach. And the wave is drifting back, and other waves are coming in, and that combination rises up, crashes down, floats up to the beach, rolls back, next wave's coming in, forms up, crashes in. So as an attack is coming in, you want to be able to lift, drift your body back. That's that coming back off the beach. And then you're going to rise up like a big wave, and come down, striking, back down into the beach. So over exaggeration, back, down, back, down, back, down, back, down. Block, strike, block, strike, block, strike. So that's the exercise aspect of the go get -on In the drill form, Let's make it a little bit more combat effective. Where from here, strong Jordan and hit. Strong hit. Strong hit. One, two. One, two. Speed it up a little bit. Put some energy into it. Strong. You're really hitting something. When someone goes to punch you, in Nimpo, everyone is nice and polite, courteous, throwing their arm out there. In real life can be here, here. It's going to come quick. It's going to come hard. If you don't practice quick, you don't practice hard, I don't care how much skill you have, 
you have to be able to match that force. Unless you're gonna let the force go by you and not deal with it, which is a, an absolute way of fighting. If you've gotta block something, you gotta stop something. Something's about to come and punch you in your face. You've gotta block it. Your skill is important. Your form is important. Your timing is important. Your mental focus is important. Your spiritual fortitude is important. But God damn it, that block better be ready. You better be ready. I had a student once who was in the beginning stages of it, and he got into a fight. And he got beat up. And he came to the dojo. And he said, Sensei, this stuff doesn't work. Every time that I went to block, I was already getting punched in the face. It just wasn't working. And I asked to see this person's block. Again, he'd been trained less than a year. And he was doing it the way we taught him. He was in Kamai. He was bringing his hand out here. He was making a nice back circle. He was using his belt knot. He was coming in and he was blocking. And he was doing it about this pace. And that's all I ever showed him. In the short period of time of training, that's all he'd ever seen. So when he got into a fight, you can only do what you know, and you can only do what you've seen. And it didn't work. The person was more aggressive, more violent, was punching at a completely different speed than the way this individual was trained. Well, that was a wake up call for me. I took that very seriously. So I began to train people, not only the basic foundation way of doing the form correctly, but also how to speed things up and match the violence and aggression in a fight. And in some cases, just bringing your hands up and protecting your face is more important than doing this very pretty Nimpo block. The blocks in Nimpo work. The scrolls, the blocks, they absolutely work. One thing that you'll learn in like Krav Maga, or even in some cases with mixed martial arts is you may learn how to go from nothing to being able to street fight quicker, absolutely, than you will with Nimpo. Nimpo is not a street fighting system. Let me say that again. Nimpo is not a street fighting system. It was designed to be used on a battlefield against professional warriors, and that professional warriors had a code of conduct and they were attacking in a very Japanese methodical way. So bad guy A, good guy B, when they fought, A and B fit. Now you've got bad guy X, Y, Z, W, Q, and good guy B, and it's not mixing. They're fighting completely differently. The guy that's doing martial arts and the guy that's attacking on the streets is completely two different things than the way a traditional student practices in a dojo. So does that mean that Nimpo will not work in a street fight? It absolutely will. But there's a learning curve. It's gonna take a little bit more time. And I'm just being honest with you. If you wanna learn how to street fight, then boxing, kickboxing, Krav Maga, things like that, less than a year, you could probably protect yourself and you could probably beat somebody up. Nimpo is an art. It is an art. It's a living art. It's living history. Can it be used to save your life in a street fight? Yes, it can. Can it be very deadly? Absolutely. Will you go to jail? Probably. So we have to be very careful. A guy who's in a regular street fight, looking like a street fighter, is one thing. A guy that's doing martial arts and kill someone is a completely different level. I wrote a newsletter about that, so I don't wanna to go too deep into it. But we're talking about street fighting, you have to be able to match that level of violence, speed, and aggression. You match violence with skill. You have to match speed with form. If your form is good, you will be efficient. If you are efficient, you are fast. 
But if someone is just set to kill you or to harm you, there's going to be a part in this scenario where no matter what style you study, you're going to have to man up, bite down, and fight. And if you think you can just stay relaxed and have this pretty form and do all the things that are in the videos and all the books and move like the grandmasters move in their 60s, 70s, and 80 year old in a fight against a 22 year old guy who lifts weights and is on drugs and he's been violent, he's got a bad home life and he's coming at you, he's coming at you for one reason, one reason only, and that is to hurt you and see you bleed. You gotta be ready, mentally and physically ready to be able to deal with that threat. How do we get ready? We have to practice for it. How do we practice for it? <clears throat> you have to spar. And that's a word most Nimpo people don't talk about, don't do. They go to the dojo, they practice their katas with a willing partner, and with a willing partner, all of this shit always works. The willing partner standing there, letting you kick him in the nuts, poke him in the eyes, take him down on the ground, he taps out, you get up and you think you did something. You did nothing, you did nothing. Having the right fortitude when you do these techniques is important. When a person comes up to grab you as they're reaching for you, covering and making sure you're ready. When you go into Kamai, you go into Kamai with a purpose. When you block, it's with a purpose. When you punch, it's with a purpose. You have to train like that, even if it's just on your own. You have to practice with some fortitude, with a purpose. You can't do that day one, day two, maybe even day 35. But eventually, this you've done it correctly now. Great. Mission one done. Now, develop it. Develop that technique. Make it faster. Make it stronger. Make it more efficient. Make your arms stronger. Make your arms faster. Make your core leaner. Make your legs stronger. Make your legs flexible. So you can take that basic form that you learn and using your body development, taking that to the next level. Then your mind and your heart. You've got to have a certain intensity to it. How you learn to do that is put some gloves on, focus minutes, have some people slap you. So you got to block. If you don't block, you get slapped. There has to be a certain amount of realism. If you don't feel pain, then you're not going to learn. I'll say it again. If you don't feel pain, you're not going to learn. Every one of you watching this, someone in your life told you, don't get too close to the fire. But all of us have felt the heat. Some of us maybe have been burned. We were told we didn't listen. The second we were burned, we felt that pain. Now we understood. Don't put your hands in the fire. I'll tell you all day long. Move 45 degrees, keep your spine straight, keep your head up, use your belt knuckle, make sure you're breathing out, breathing in, mental focus is spiritual focus. All this needs to be done in a fight. But the second you get punched in the face, a tooth falls out, you taste your own blood, and you're laying on the ground. When you stand up, you're gonna do two, two of one things. You're gonna run away like a little scared child, or you're gonna get in come eye and you're gonna fight. And that's the choice you have to make. If you're somewhere in between running away and fighting, you're gonna lose. You run away, or you stand and fight. And if you stand and fight, you've got to be ready to go the distance. That's what you can't teach. I've had students who come to me that on the mat, their technique was perfect, beautiful. In a real life situation, they folded up. They just didn't have it in them. They were not fighters, and that's okay. You can train this martial art for the rest of your life, but you've got to learn how to avoid fights while you become an artist. It's that simple. Or, as you become an artist, you've got to forge your body like a temple to be ready to use your art in combat if needed. It's one or the other. You practice this art for the art and love of it, 
or you practice this art to become an efficient warrior. And there's no in between where you're going to do a little bit of both. It's kind of one or the other. You either run or you fight. So when we practice on our own, we're doing both. We're learning how to get the skill sets that we need that form that follows function. We also have to have the spiritual and mental energy to know that this is for real. Visualize this is for real. <clears throat> get strong with it. And then slowly work in with a partner and pad up. Just pad up. Pad everything up. They make these arm guards, leg guards, shin guards. Go buy lacrosse equipment. Go buy football equipment, hockey equipment. Just pad up. Protect yourself with your training partners so you can hit. There's plenty of sparring gear out there that Taekwondo uses, that other styles of martial arts use, and go out and buy it and go out and use it. Get a mouthpiece. Do this stuff slow. Work yourself up. You know, don't just beat the hell out of each other like Fight Club. Work yourself up to this. And it all starts with you alone training, right? So I don't want to talk forever. People that know me know that I can just go and go and go and go. Next time we look at the clock, it's 1 o'clock in the morning, and we ain't even trained yet. <clears throat> but here's what we need to do. Again, Chino cop, quick review, <clears throat> making sure that it's some, make sure there's some sense of urgency. Same thing with Sweet. One, two, one, two. Okay. Next is Ka, the element of fire. Same thing here. Jodanuke Urashto. Jodanuke Urashto. This time, again, having that fortitude here. Notice that I'm still controlled. I'm not off balance. Everything is coming here. Jordan, strike. Knees are over top of your toes. Hips are down. Okay. Let's talk about Fu no Kata. Fu represents the wind. Okay? And just to let you know that the five elements are represented by the fingers as well. Chi, the pinky. Chi, sui, water, ring finger. Ka, middle finger. Fu, wind, pointer finger. And then ku, void, emptiness. It's the thumb. Chi, sui, ka, fu, ku. That's important. Right? So again, quick review. Chi no kata. Purposeful step. Purposeful strike. Sui no kata. Back hard. Like popping of a fire here. With the urashto. The blocks here. But then this is going to come up quick. And out. Make sure you're pulling here. One. Two. On that there. Okay. Now, like a weather vane on top of a building spins around in the wind. You know, the wind hits it and it turns. <clears throat> Think a little bit like that with this pattern here. We're going to do a data nuke using like a small hook coming up underneath of the leg behind the heel and pulling that. So just think about reaching down and grabbing something and pulling it, catching it, pulling it, catching it, pulling it, catching it, pulling it, catching it. And with the leg and the body, pulling it, right? So this is not just like a strike. This actually is hitting and pulling, pulling as I strike. The strike can be with the Shikan Ken or can be the Boshi Ken. Why is there two? Why is it Shikan Ken or Boshi Ken? I want to give you some insight. I don't care if it's a five finger strike, a one finger strike, a pinky strike, a phoenix eye strike, a palm strike, a regular fist. The principle here is pulling something and being able to deliver some type of a strike. Okay. Big confusion over Minaka Sensei does it with Shikan Ken. Some of the Shihans in Japan 
Who are the sheep not king? Hatsumi Sensei originally taught him what a boshi ken. And my teacher, Daishan Filiger, uses a boshi ken. So when I teach Shikan Ken, I'm thinking, my goodness, my own teacher and Hatsumi Sensei both do a boshi ken. So should I just say no more Shikan Ken, just do boshi ken? But I've seen a lot of people do Shikan Ken. So it doesn't matter what the Ken is, what the strike is. It matters to the people in Japan. <clears throat> if you're doing Shikan Ken and they say do Boshi Ken, don't go, oh yeah, I was told that too. Just go, Domo Arigato. Act like it's a surprise. Domo Arigato. Like they just gifted you something. It's a big hint and clue with the Japanese and just teachers in general. Even if I was to show something to you and you've seen it before, the worst thing I want to hear or anybody else want to hear is, oh yeah, 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 I, I know that. Oh, you do? You know that, great. Or if I say, uh, you should be doing that with a, a Boshi Ken. Oh, but I seen other teachers do it with a Shikan Ken. So why, why do a Boshi Ken with you when I was in Japan and I seen them doing Shikan Ken, now you're telling me Boshi Ken. Why, why is that? Don't even go into the why. Just go, Domo arigato gozaimashita. In English, hey man, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to recognize me and try to help me. Because that's what you were trying to do. You were just trying to help me. You weren't showing off. You weren't belittling me. You weren't making fun of me and everybody else. You were just at this moment right now, you took the time to gift me and you tried to help me. So for that, thank you very much. Hell, you knew it. You knew all these different ways. You practiced them all these different ways. You didn't need to say nothing to that man. Just say, domo arigato. Thank you. And then to the best of your ability, try to do it exactly the way he's doing it, right? That whole when in Rome. If I'm in one teacher's dojo and I see them kicking with the toes of the foot, but I was taught to heal in that dojo, I use my toes. If they're doing Boshi Ken and I'm practicing Shikan Ken, and in, I may do Shikan Ken once, I look around and see that 90% of the people, especially the Japanese, are doing Boshi Ken, guess what? I'm doing Boshi Ken. And while I'm doing Boshi Ken, if he comes over and corrects me and says I should be doing Shikan Ken, I don't go, whoa, 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 whoa. All these people in here, especially some of the Japanese guys, they were doing it the other way. Why are they doing that? No, 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 no. Don't ever do that. Just go, hi, domo arigato. And do it the way he just told you. And if he comes back five minutes later and tells you to do it differently, don't say why, just do it differently. Your life will be a lot easier. Here I go again. So making sure that this comes down is fully strike. Fully, right? So everything I'm doing, I'm over-exaggerating. We're training with the go get on copper. We're not warming up with it. We're not doing a drill. We're not doing an exercise. We're training with it, right? So when the kick comes in or attack comes in, I'm pulling it. I'm not hitting it away. I'm pulling it. So whatever they're attacking with, you want to pull them a little bit off balance or just get them a little bit off balance, right? You're trying to disrupt their balance. Remember, if they have balance, they can load that up and put force and energy behind it. If they're off balance, think of it as a boat with holes in it. If the boat is now holes, it floats. If you can put holes in a boat that would take on water, it becomes heavy, it becomes slow, it doesn't float. When someone has their balance, they've got good buoyancy. They can float, they can be fast. But if you can take away that balance, take away that buoyancy, throw off their energy a little tiny bit, then you've got to regain that balance before they can attack. And in some cases, if they are faster, stronger, and more skilled than you, the more that you can disrupt their balance, all that does, it evens out the playing field. Now, hopefully, their aggression throws their mental game off. Your calmness and your skill, again, matches that. So even if someone is stronger, more violent, and faster, if you can stay calm, a great form, great spiritual and mental fortitude, be prepared to fight, anticipate, react with strength and courage. Even if they're more aggressive, violent, bigger, stronger, you've got a chance to survive the moment. And in Nimpo, that's all we need to do. There's no ninja plastic trophies. You survive a fight, you go home to your family. You don't survive the fight, best case scenario, you go home, 
busted up, bleeding, maybe some bumps and bruises. Worst case scenario, everyone knows you end up dead. So when you get into a physical conflict, you have to remember that your overall strategy as a NIMPO or ninja practitioner has failed. You didn't sense, you didn't see, you didn't predict, you didn't plan, you didn't strategize, and now violence is in front of you. So your game plan, your hiojutsu, your strategy has failed if you're in a physical confrontation. Remember, a ninja was a master of gathering information. So his mission was to go from point A to point B, confirm or deny information, bring that information back so a plan could be made and then another exercise could be done or another mission can be done to accomplish another mission and then you'd return. If a ninja was seen and he was caught, he'd have to kill himself. The mission failed. The whole strategy failed. The whole plan failed. So it was very important to do what you had to do and come home unseen. And we need to live life a little bit like that. If we can live our lives unseen by danger, unseen by violence, go to where we need to go, come home to our sanctuary, life is a lot easier. <clears throat> Did you know that? Let's go on to the last one. This is void, coup. This is basically a distraction. So this one here is something low comes at you and you're striking here. Your backhand is either gonna physically take some type of blinding agent. Could be charcoal ash, peppers, glass, stones, anything, pieces of paper, money, a wallet, something that you throw up into the air, dirt, sand, grass, whatever. Something that your hand comes up so the opponent, bad guy, his eyes are fixated on something at a higher level, which allows you to get your kick in, right? So think of it as three parts. One, two, three, and then come up. So we want to practice that as block, strike, kick, back, right? So again, here, punish, like look. And it's okay, wait, wiggle your fingers. If you've got nothing fizzy to throw, If hopefully they go and that's where the kick comes in right so your mind cannot be focused on the kick your mind has to be on the illusion end of here so let your eyes go with it so your hand your eyes and your illusion of attention is up you want them to think that maybe you're coming down with some type of a strike you want to think that they did throw something at you. So they cover their eyes and they cover their face. You want to distract their mind or put them on a defensive end. Flash of a flashlight. Anything that can get their eyes up. One, two, three. And that kick has to be for real. One, two, three. Heel, foot, opportunity target, kage, Sternum, center chest bone, go in, belly button, kick in the groin if you have to, center the face, whatever. If they're coming with a punch, kick into the shoulder blade. Whatever the opportunity target is, is what you use. A lot of people ask me, Sensei, what are my targets for that? Like, with this particular strike, what is the target? And yes, there is certain targets that are more advantageous than others. But in a real life situation, you're not gonna have a menu to pick from. You're gonna get what they give you. And you've gotta either create space to take advantage of something or recognize space and utilize it. Same here. All I'm trying to do is they're attacking something low on me and I'm blocking it. I'm distracting them from kicking and I'm quickly going back to come on, ready to go to the next level because this kick is going to drive them away but I'm still going to have to engage in some way all right so here strong one two kick back ready to go look them in the eyes stare them in the eyes don't stare at them with like come on bitch stare at them in the eyes like stop stop you don't even need to say it but sometimes if they feel it and then they hear you verbalize it Stop! And you say it like you would tell a little boy who's getting ready to run out on the road. 
stop firm. I have seen people just shake and fall when grandmasters have done that. I personally have people walking towards me, getting ready to punch, and I put two fingers up and I yell at them to stop. And I can see them just shake and he's stopping their bones. And then he start talking and yelling and cussing. But they stop moving. And I did that with my energy and my intention. So the go gyo kata is learning how to work with earth, water, fire, wind, and void. The illusion of nothingness. We haven't touched him or done nothing. But we've distracted them to a space where nothing exists. We want to put their mind in this emptiness, which allows us to have that kick come out of nowhere. So those are some of the insights of the Gogyo no Kata. And if you practice them with intention, based on combat, also with the five elements, and develop your body strong enough to do them, the Gogyo no Kata can be an incredible learning lesson and can take your Taijutsu to the next step. Okay, what I've got here is simple five pound weights. <clears throat> These are just simple five pound dumbbells. Uh, you can get them anywhere, they're relatively cheap. You can put your finger through them and you hold them. What I want you to learn how to do with these things is to do the go no kata uh, with them in your hand. It's a simple five pound weight. So when you're here and you're practicing the kata in a slow methodic drill, you can do that 10 times, right? <clears throat> you just imagine I did that 10 times. And then I practice it with a little bit more fortitude, or we were doing a little earlier. Actually striking a little bit harder with the hands, you know, using them. Same thing with the uh, the next pattern, with the joranuke, mote shuto, joranuke, mote shuto. Do those with the five pound weights in your hand. All of the different patterns, do them with the weights in your hands, right? So you're learning how to build a little bit of strength with this here, you know? And you can put ankle weights around your legs. But these weights will take your training to the next level. It'll give you a little bit more speed, a little bit more strength, a little bit more overall cardiovascular training. So not just to go get a kata, but practice all of your katas with weights in your hand. The next section I want to talk about is called the Sanpo no Kata. The Sanpo no Kata is part of the Kyo Hapo of uh, Gyokuru. Uh, so the Sanpo no Kata is Ichimonji, Jumonji, and Hichi no Kata. <clears throat> and then when you get into the Taraite Kyo no Kata, Omote Gyak, Ura Gyak, all of that stuff. These are the first three of what's classically considered to be part of the Kyo Hapo. This is the Sanpo, this is the three hearts. What you want to do here is the same thing. The go gyo no kata, we're working on fundamental movements, learning how to transition our weight, learning how to understand the elements, transform the elements into our body, and then make them very combat effective, and then link them together to be able to do an exercise, to be able to warm up, condition our body, and still do martial arts. The San no kata is strictly learning how to move on angles and learning how to move with specific types of attacks. <clears throat> Not getting too detailed into Gyokuru, uh, because Gyokuru Ichimonji no Kamai looks like this here. It's kind of different from the classical Katate Ichimonji no Kamai. So, so in Gyokuru, which is, comes from a Chinese system, Cho Gyoko is a princess, a female princess, who escaped China with a cook who was also a bodyguard, but it was her personal cook um, and a bodyguard. And um, Chinese have arranged marriages. She wasn't going for that. She fell in love with this warrior. They escaped China, went to Japan, and together needed to survive and had martial skills. And their cook, who was actually the one who took it, uh, began to teach and train people uh, in Japan. And uh, that's some of the origins of Gyokuru. And he also brought traces of ninjutsu. That's how it's tied to Gyokuru as well. But, I don't want to go too big on the history lessons. We will definitely get into the Ruha's for sure. But in Gyokuru, probably, because I studied Wing Chun Kung Fu and Chin Kung Fu, probably had some type of a traditional Chinese stance, where the traditional Chinese stance is a little bit here. This hand is kind of coming to this side of the face. This is coming to this side of the face. 
and they're kind of crossing each other down so you can block and you can move and you've got a 360 degree protection. Well, the Kamai from Gyokuru, from the Chinese position, simply this hand moves up on top and becomes a fist. This hand fingers are closed and becomes down. And then the Kamai is not so short, it becomes a little bit longer. Okay? So that is my opinion of how it went from a Chinese system to a Japanese system. But this is Ichimonji no Kamai from Gyokuru. And the movement is going to be more circular, where we're hitting off and then coming around, where it's not linear, like you'll see in, say, Kukishinru or Kotaru. Gyokuru is more circular on all kinds of different planes. So when we're training with this here, one, two. Get it to where you can almost jump with it. But get it to where it's one, two, one, two, one, two. And move around with it. Freestyle with it. Start off facing this direction here. I'm gonna do a little slow, but just end up moving different places. Where I'm just doing that Jodan, Zamote Shuto. But I'm doing it at like a 360 degree where I'm fighting multiple opponents. Get out in your training space and just go with it. Don't practice it over and over here. One, two. Okay, great. This guy, boom, he's down. Another person attacks me. One, two. Now I'm attacked from this direction. One, two. Now I'm attacked from behind. One, two. Learn to move with it. Don't worry so much about your feet. Let your feet go where they need to go. Don't focus on my feet. Must, should, it's correct, correct movement, correct form. In this exercise, I want you to flow. I want you to become unattached to that rail, unattached to that form. I want you to learn how to move so you can fight in a circle. You can fight against multiple attackers. You can move. Even if you weren't blocking and punching, just the fact that it's teaching you how to move around in areas can be very beneficial. Learn how to move. So the first one, Ichi Manji no Kata, can teach you that. One, two. Then you just come back with it the other direction. And just keep moving. You'll zigzag around. You'll do circles. But I think if you can train with that, and then again, get your weights, right? Get your weights and practice one, two, one, two, one, two. Just be careful, you got weights in your hand, right? I had a student once come up, boom, knocked his own tooth out. So be careful how you hold these. If you got big enough hands, you can hold them like this. You can practice and keep them from falling out of your hands, which will make your grip when you grab something a lot stronger. I put my thumb through the holes, my hands are on top, and I practice with them like that. That's how I do it, right? but you can do it any way you want. But practice the Ichimonji with the weights as well. Next is Jumonji no Kata. So Jumonji, if you take the word 10, made with an X. That's how you make the Japanese kanji for 10. Crossing here, right? A little bit more straight up and crossing here. Get down. You're not horizontal. You're not totally flush. Kind of 45, down. Jumanji, Hoko no Kamai, Kosi no Kamai, all have this leg posture. Left leg's in front, left hand is out in front. It's never left leg in front, right hand out in front. It's always same side, right? And when I say always, it's not literally always, you can do it the opposite way to distract your opponent. But in true form, you want to make sure you have it here. Jodan Boshiken eyes. That's the basics, right? Reverse, Jodan, touch, push, eyes. Let this stay here as it transfers back to Kamai. One, two, eyes. Right? Just get used to that. Backwards, forwards. Backwards, backwards, forward, backwards. The shifting of weight's important. 
Now, take it to a little bit more speed, where you're here, where the attack comes in, and it's one, two, three. You catch that? One, two, three. And forward the whole time. Block. Drive with the bush skin. Attack to the eye. Now he's attacking again. Step back this hand. One, two, three. To the eyes. He stops. One, two, three. Back. Get the weights in your hand again. Same thing. One, two, eyes. One, two, eyes. Use those legs. One, two, eyes. One, two, eyes. Let that body move. Okay? Don't be stationary. Danger. Okay? Block. Attacking. Eyes. The way we do it in kata is back, forward, back, because we're transitioning to that second block. Okay? So Jumanji is something you can do again all over the place. Block, Boshikin, eyes. But imagine attack coming from here. Block, Boshikin, eyes. Somebody's attacking from behind me. Block, Boshikin, eyes. Block, Boshikin, eyes. Over here. Block, Boshikin, eyes. Behind me. Block, Boshikin, eyes. And just learn to move with Bobi no Kamai and Jumanji no Kamai. All right, the last one of the Sanpo no Kata is Hichi no Kata. Hichi no Kata basically symbolizes a water crane. You know, how a big water crane will actually sit in the water with one leg up on top of his legs. And what he's doing with that one leg on top of the legs is, <clears throat> one, it's less resistance in moving tide, right? So we have one leg in moving water, the water just goes around it. When you have two legs in the water, you've got resistance on both of the legs. That's one thing. Another more important part is for the bird is that when the foot is up on top of the lake, it's not down in the mud. <clears throat> what he's doing is he's looking for fish to swim by. <clears throat> if he has both his feet and a fish swims by and he has to pull one foot up out of the mud, that will disturb the soil of the mud, put a soot into the water, number one, making it very hard for him to see. Number two, it changes that natural environment that the fish is used to and he's scared and runs away. Having that one foot up above the water line when the fish swims down, he can come right down with his foot. It doesn't bring up disturbance. He can come right down and get the fish, flies away, enjoys his lunch. So this technique, because Hichinokata is based off of that water crane using that one leg because it looks like that. Obviously we're not fishing with this foot, <clears throat> but it has a lot of the same similar purposes. We're getting it out of the way so it doesn't cause a distraction. Talking about hichi no kamai, not so much hichi no kata, but if someone's going to bring like a, a roundhouse leg, like a Muay Thai, or sometimes you see the Brazilian guys come out and they'll kick it to the thigh, and trust me, you get five or six real strong blows to the thigh or the outer knee, it can end your day, you know what I mean? So you really have to have strong conditioning to be able to take those kicks. So in Nimpo, when we've got a leg that's out in front, it becomes a very big target for someone to do that low roundhouse kick either to our calf muscle or to our thigh. When you see that low kick come, to be able to get out of the way with that kick and have balance is very important. So that's something to practice all by itself is just being on one foot and moving to your other foot and being able to keep your balance in different directions. So you can use it to train with, right? So if I'm here and someone comes, using this and coming back with balance is going to be important. So learning that skill set is going to help you. And Hichi no Kata is teaching us that. So basically something is coming low. We're not sure if it's going to be a sword cut, a kick, whatever. It all works. You're going to be able to take whatever's coming in a low attack, bring this back, and bring your hands, sorry, this guy, back and block down. That's step number one. So what we want to do is practice that using these knuckles here to cause as much punishment to whatever's coming. Right? If it's a punch, if it's a kick, whatever it is, making sure that we're damaging that and we're clearing it from that center line. It's cleared away. We're giving us room to be able to attack. Right? So that comes in here, one. 
The next step we're going to be able to do is kick with the same leg that we perched. So if we're here, I want to be able to use this foot to be able to kick back, right? One, two, step, orashuto. That's the basic pattern. One, two, orashuto. One, two, orashuto, right? <clears throat> Again, putting the weights in your hand, developing that. And also what I recommend is doing patterns like this in a river with the current coming towards you. So when you come through the water, the current is moving you, kicking through the water, stepping with your lower body through the water. And if you can, do this about waist high. And then keep coming up, lowering yourself down. You don't want to get too high because then the water's buoyancing you up. But make sure you're practicing on like a little bit of a rocky bottom. So when you move, your balance is weirded out. You gotta learn how to get it. The way you get your balance is sinking your hips down and planting that foot down, keeping your nose center line. If you go too far back, you're gonna be off balance. If you come too far forward and compensate, you're gonna get knocked out. So you have to stay straight here. So when the attack comes, I'm staying straight here with you. Everything is staying centralized. That's important. Just learn to go slow, sink your weight down, put your foot and just sit there. I would tell people, brush your teeth. Change legs, change hands. Um, if you're waiting for something in the microwave, do it on one foot. Uh, just, just practice it until you get down. Practice one, two, three. Just keep practicing that until you get comfortable with it. Now, what the Hichino Kata is, once we clear something away and that kick comes, you want to be able to have that power of that pushing leg here. So, when we're here, Whatever the kick is, if your flexing body is no good and you can just snap kick to the groin area, that's great. You know, ball kick to the stomach, that's fine. Kick to the chest, that's fine. Kick to the head, that's fine. Attack something. They're attacking you, stop them, get them away, and then learn to power through them. Explode off that leg when you do that shoot though. You know? So you're here, kick, plant this foot and power with that shoot though. Using your whole body, your arm, elbows in center, that's really gonna have an effect here. Kick straight through, right? So one of the mistakes I see is people go, here, it's tall, you know? One, two, three, you know, come on. Those are very important aspects of Hichinokata. Thank you.